helpful to know where the right switches are. <laughs> I said that, um, in case you didn't hear me earlier, that the highlight was when Jennifer prayed there at the altar because God worked so much in my heart. And I tell you, God was working as much outside of that little room we were in as he was inside. We were out um, one evening um, with some of the counselors, and it was approaching midnight, and we could see kind of a group over to our right, and uh, we just kind of ignored them. For some, I mean, I guess that was our job to kind of say, what are you doing out here past curfew? But we just kind of ignored it and went on with our conversations. And uh, pretty soon we realized that a, a whole like little troop of girls come marching by and they were all in their, their, their night shirts and things like that. And they just come marching by and none of us said, why are these girls out at midnight? None of us said that because they were just over there and they came marching by and I mean these girls were fired up. They did not say, excuse us, we're sorry we're out, we're going back to our cabin now. They came by shouting praises and going, the devil's a liar, he's defeated, now we've defeated him tonight and man they were marching victoriously into their cabins. Now that's the kind of camp you want to be at. They weren't out looking to get into this or that or the other thing. They were out having a great prayer meeting and, camp, and cabin number five had revival in their cabin. And they were really leading the way there in testimony night to campfire the next night. I want to tell you, I believe the whole cabin was up there testifying as to what God was doing. And that revival came, many revival came through prayer. Many things happened like that. We were coming back home and uh, some girl was sitting there and talking to Greg and I guess I was asleep and she said, you know, uh, I had a wonderful time at camp and we were up to 2 o'clock one morning and a girl got back to God that morning and I mean, and she was telling it and uh, they said, uh, Greg was saying, oh yeah, well that's a wonderful privilege. She goes, yeah, it's Susie Bracken. I want to tell you Susie Bracken got back to God. I didn't know Susie Bracken was away from God. But I want to tell you, Susie, the great thing about it was Susie was still on fire on Sunday. And I want to tell you, she was not only on fire in the church service, but Karen Gable told me as soon as she hit her doorstep, she began to witness to one of her family that was not saved how God helped her get her heart right with her, and the lady immediately fell under conviction. I'm thankful because the kids got off the bus they got off the bus, and I mean, I saw many of them go right up to people and tell them what God had done in their life. You didn't have to pump them, prime them, get them up, get them ready. I want to tell you, they were obeying God. The girl that uh, Jennifer prayed with, she got on, uh, on Mandy's porch, and Mandy's mother came out, and the first thing came out of her mouth was, I got saved, and she got saved, and she got saved too. But I want to tell you, that's what will bring revival. Nothing more and nothing less. We think God's up in heaven above getting ready to shake out a great outpouring on us and some days from now and a great sweet by and by. But revival is ours as soon as we will possess it. The Israelis were in the promised land 40 years too late. And I don't want to be 40 years too late. But I think, I thank God, even though when we're determined and even though we feel invincible, and I don't know about you, but when I hear a song like that and when I'm stirred up, I want to hit somebody or something. <laughs> I've kicked that pulpit all to pieces. I've destroyed plants. I remember one time telling the people at the Outreach Center how, you, how your parents grab your kids and just start dragging them. So the closest thing to me was, an old, was one of these plastic potted plants and I just grabbed it and jerked it out and pins and dirt and everything come flying out and everybody was like going, my wife was going, he's lost his mind. <laughs> and, and I'm just dragging this plant. I thought it would all stay intact, but I'm like, it, I said, don't worry about it. It's paid for. So I like to kick things and my shoes are scuffed up and beat up and it's not because I don't know how to walk right. It's because when I get excited, I kick things. Some people run, some people cry. I kick things and hit things. (laughs) 
Yes, the violent do take it by force. Because that was one of that was one of the scriptures God gave me. You cannot go plunder the strong man's house until you have first bound that strong man. And the place you begin to initially bind the strong man is in your own heart. Because even when we feel invincible, sometimes we're not invincible and there's a big old missile of shrapnel or something comes in and hits us, knocks a hole in our spiritual life that big around, but it's not time to quit. It's time to go and trust in the blood. The question is not whether or not the devil can get you to fail, but it's whether or not he can get you to quit. We're all failures, but none of us should be quitters. And people tell me over and over, and the young people tell me, yeah, you preach it straight, you preach it straight, you preach it. And I feel like I was kind of holding back on them a little bit. <clears throat> and one of the messages I preached there was, you do not date unbelievers. For any reason, at any time, for any purposes, because it will ruin your life. Amen. And so I was telling some people about that, and they said, you can't preach that in such and such church. You can't tell them to do that and everything. And it always bothers me when people tell me that I'm telling other people how to live their lives. Because I don't feel like I am. But what I'm trying to help people do is to make informed choices. Because I hear adults over and over again come up to me and whine. You know, they get a microphone and they say, Well, oh, praise God, I wish I heard that message 40 years ago. You probably did, you just didn't listen to it. Amen. We've got to hear it. Amen. And it's up to you whether you do anything with it or not, but all my, my responsibility is to make, to deliver it when the door opens, when I have opportunity. Because the choice is ours. But you and I need to make informed choices. We need to have all the facts down. We need to have all the facts. We need to know, yes, we can, if you're a ch kid, you can date that unsaved boy, but the facts you better know is this. I've never seen hardly anybody bring somebody else to Christ that way. Why? Because it's not his method. But I've seen slews and slews and slews of them get into that and boom, they're sunk, they're made shipwreck of a faith. God wants us to make an informed choice. He wants us to make an informed choice about disobedience. So turn with me to the second chapter of Genesis. And God said, <coughs> Genesis chapter 2, verse 17, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat of it. For in the day that you eat thereof you shall surely die. That's what God said. God told Adam, If you eat of that tree, you are surely going to die. I want to tell you something. People try so many times to say God's a hard task. Master, God's a spoiler of your good times. That there's no good times with God, there's no good times in the kingdom. I want to tell you, it's a lie. It's a lie from an angel called Lucifer, whom we have replaced in praising God. God is praised by angels. Lucifer was the chief angel of praise, and that's why he tries to fight us praising God more than just about anything else. And so jump over with me in chapter 3, verse 4. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. He said that to Eve. That was a lie. Now I want to tell you something. God told Adam not to eat. Eve was not around at that time. Because if you look in the verse, verse 18, in case you think God's mean and God's cruel and all God wants to do is take your fun, take all your good times, look in verse 18. 
And the Lord said, it's not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a help me for him. At the second after God gave down the warning, he didn't say, now, brother, you do it, and I've got you because I see everything. I see everything. You do it, and I've got you. He said, that's not for you, and it's not good that you're alone. I'm going to make somebody for you. Taylor May. That's why it's important to get, get God's mate for you because if you get the one God leads in, you will have as great as a time in potential as Adam did with Eve. I believe it. I believe it with all my heart. God will give you a great time with the one he has for you. And so the next thing after he said don't do that is he gave you a great time. Now that's the way the kingdom is. God will tell you don't do certain things. But he tells you that for a reason so you can obey him so you can have the good things of the kingdom. Problem is with a lot of people is they all they hear is the negative and they're turned off by the negative. They never live in the positive. They never live in the reality of the Christian life. And so we got a bunch of people trying to live a life without the promises. And they're a bunch of sour pusses and they have no idea what the kingdom of God's all about. And so they're just going on saying, I'm saved, it's a great thing, it's a wonderful thing. And you know what? If you have that kind of testimony, it's metallic, it's solid, it's stale, and it's old. If you are up to date, then you will not say, I was saved at one time, thank God for the old times. You will say that that experience will be just as up to date as every other experience. They all will be equal. They all will be equal. We had church coming to church tonight. When we get revival, when revival comes, church will be going on everywhere. So she was told a lie. Now I want to tell you something. She was told a lie, and she believed the serpent not primarily more than God, but primarily more than her husband. Because he was the one that said to her, God said this. God told me this. Now I want to tell you, that. see I was always wondering, how in the world could they have gotten to God? How in the world, you know, if you've got God talking to you face to face, and you've got the devil talking to you face to face, how in the world are you going to mess up? Well, that's why she messed up. Because she did not have God tell her face to face. She had Adam tell her face to face. And that's the same thing. Why we're not sanctified? Because we're not washed by the water, by the word. Because we think if it comes through the mouth of a man, we can take it or leave it. It's the take it or leave it that's got us messed up. You say, I don't, that, that's too fanatical for me. I'm afraid I'll mess up. God will not let you mess up if you do that. Yeah, you may, you may be misled. You may get in an awful place. You, yes, that may happen. But if you're really sincere and you're seeking God's will, He will get you back on the right path. Because the devil's not controlling this thing. God is. In other words, all the time fighting the devil. And you can't fight the devil because you've not got in you've not got and had a great time fellowshipping with your heavenly father. So we're gun shy about demons instead of having great confidence because God's in our heart and in our life. There's another tragedy in Genesis. Genesis 4, 8. And Cain talked with his father and slew him. God said to Adam, if you eat of this, you're going to die. Now, Adam was a very intelligent person, very intelligent man. He named all the beasts. He, he gave all things names. But I want to tell you, Adam did not know what death was. Just like he didn't know what a woman was until God said, here's a woman. He did not know what death was, and God said, you're going to surely die. And so he na even named his wife. Did you know that? He said, you're going to be named Eve because you're going to be the mother of all the living. And so he named his wife Eve. And so they had children. They had two children. And life kind of went on. It was a little bit rougher than the garden, you know. It wasn't the same. 
and, and, and it, what, God wasn't there, but life kind of just went on. Existence did not stop until one day Adam had the news brought to him. Abel is dead. He's dead. His own brother killed him. He slew him. He's Life went out of him. Adam was older than his son, and no doubt the man looked on to that body, and it finally dawned on him a little bit of what God had said. Death will surely come about. Turn with me to the fifth chapter of Genesis. Verse 5. And all the days that Adam lived were 930 years, and he died. God's promise came to pass. It took 930 years, but it came upon him. God's word was true. God wants us to make informed choices about disobedience. He wants us to be informed about it. The blood cleanses us from all sin. But I want to tell you something. Turn with me to 1 John real quickly. 1 Everybody quotes 1 John 1, 9, right? If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's the Word of God. Now look up. Verse 6, this is also the Word of God. If we say that we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ His Son cleanses us from all sin. If we walk in darkness, we, we lie and we don't practice the truth. Now the blood cleanses us from all sin. That's a biblical truth. But there's also a biblical truth that says this. If you do these things and you're doing them on a consistent, ongoing, constant basis with no repentance and no change in the lifestyle, you will not go to heaven and there are no exception clauses in those statements. No exception clauses. God wants us to be well informed. God wants you, backslider tonight, that you need to be informed. That you are not on the ground God wants you on. You said, well, but I just did what I did tonight before I came to church. I don't care. God does not, one thing God does not like is a space in between disobedience and repentance. He doesn't want that. He wants repentance and, and disobedience to be put behind you. He wants you to be informed that if you don't get things right before you die, it's too late then. He wants you to be informed of that. He wants you to be informed that disobedience does not pay. He wants you to be informed that living for Jesus, yes, it has its up and downs. Yes, we fall. Yes, we're defeated sometimes. Sometimes, if you're living in constant discouragement and defeat, you're not a struggler. That does not qualify you to be a struggler. Because God's made the way for us to live a little bit better than just struggling all the time. I know God helps strugglers, and I know strugglers are going to make it, but God does not want Maranatha Fellowship to be struggling all the time. You've got ground to take. You've got people to come in after you. You've got a destiny before you. And you've got to fulfill it. I told the kids at youth camp that revival was their destiny. It was no accident. Now it may have been by chance that some other people sitting in some camp somewhere, but it was no accident that they were sitting in that camp at that time hearing my voice. That was not an accident. That was God-led and God-ordained. 
He said, how do you know? Because I want to tell you something. The way you know God's led in something is you hear about it before it comes to pass. See, I'm sick of everybody saying God led this and God led that and basically all they did was do their own will and when whatever come to pass, God led this. But when God's speaking before and you have a man before you that says this is what we're going to do and then it's done, you can say God's led it. Amen. When you were in bird machinery and he said it's property number five, it's 2910 Canal Terrace, where to go there, possess the land, and you're here now and you possess it, then you can say God led it. Amen. But when you just show up somewhere in a church building some, sometime and do your own thing and and just kind of flounder around, don't put God's approval on it. Because God's an organizer. He showed me how to put one block on top of another. We are a spiritual house and God wants to build us. What would we do right now if, let's say those bricks were numbered and brick number... 1,289 said, look guys, I've been here 14, 15 years. Tired of being here. All I do is just stand around and hold this place up. I'm out of here. And then the two blocks beside of them said, hey, I'm with you. And then the blocks on top of them said, hey, our support's leaving. We better get out from out of here before this whole thing falls down. That's the way churches fall apart. You ought to be sure that you belong here. And if you belong, not not to knock you out. My observation is you can't get the people that belong to stay and you can't get the people that don't belong to leave. Because we're bent to do what we want to do. And the Bible says we're mad at God. You know what you do when you're mad at somebody? You wait to, what, you wait to find out what their opinion is and you want to, just the opposite. Because you're itching to pick a fight. And that's the way it is in the heart of men and women out in the world today. That's why you get so many scuffles about God. Because they're itching to pick a fight with God and they can't see God, but you're the next best thing, yes, so they'll pick sir. one with you. Yes, sir. God make, wants us to make informed choices about disobedience. God wants us to make informed choices about warnings. Turn to the first chapter of the book of Matthew. Matthew 1, <clears throat> verse 18. Mary became pregnant with Jesus through the Holy Ghost. And Joseph, because he didn't want to make her a public example, he was going to put her away privately. Verse 20, 120. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth the Son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth the Son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took unto him his wife, and he knew her not. That means they did not have sexual relations until she brought forth her firstborn son and he called Joseph. Joseph named the child. And he called his name Jesus. God gives us warnings in the Christian lives. He wants us to obey him and he wants us to know what to do. He doesn't want us floundering and he doesn't want us flopping around on the land like a fish out of water. But it hurts me to see many Christians suffering because they disregard God's warnings. If you disregard God's warnings, it leads
needs, it makes a person, I've seen it happen over and over and over again, it takes a very confident, self-assured Christian man and it takes away his, and he begins to doubt and he's not so confident and he's not so on fire anymore because he's ignored a warning. God absolutely does not you and I want you and I in the business of knocking each other down. Listen. But first of all, time out. I know some things have got to be discussed sometimes. Especially if God's put you in a certain type of ministry. Now I don't know whether you know it or not, but God has secret agents. He does. God has ambassadors. Did you know that's in the Bible? You know what an ambassador does? An ambassador represents somebody for somebody else. And I believe... By God's grace, that has been one of my callings. I've been in places with people and they start telling me things and I'm going, Whoa, I don't want to hear this. I don't want you to ask me those questions. I don't. Stop it. But you can't do that. You just have to sit there and say, Yes, that's wonderful. Great. And give them the best answer you can and talk and try to be a peacemaker and try to handle things before they ever blow up out in front. If you really knew how many time bombs had been disassembled in this church that could have blown it all to pieces in the history of its life, you would probably be amazed. Brother, God's got bomb squads. And they see a bomb and they know that thing might go off. But I'm going to tell you they'll get there and the Holy Ghost will tell them just how to disassemble that thing and it never blows up. And the enemy goes, man, that was a good one. I worked for years on that thing. I got this one to do just that, and I got that one to do that, and I got them together, and that thing was going to blow up, and there was going to be people flying everywhere, and the gospel was going to be made ashamed of. Oh, I hit them. But there was a saint on the scene. And they found me out. The Holy Ghost knows more than we know. And he tells those people down there what we're up to. Those people that pray on their knees. Oh, I hate those kind of people. They're the ones that hear the secrets in the closets. And they're the ones that take care of my bombs before I can blow them up. Oh, man, when they're not around, I have a time. I blow them up left and right. I just do it for fun sometimes. But when those prayers are around... I have a time. Let me tell you something. God may want you diffusing major powder kegs about to go off here or over there or there. And I want to tell you the number one thing is unity. Brother, it's unity. I tell you, the devil hates unity more than he hates about anything else. Because unity will bring the answer every time. Husbands and wives, if you'll be unified, the answer, the devil can't stop the answer. I mean, it will just break through and come upon you. Because God is greater than the devil. I believe the Christian church needs about five million sermons on God is greater than the devil. Because all we hear about is Jesus struggling with the devil and the demon struggling with us and we're all in this great big struggle. I'll admit I've been whipped many times by the powers of darkness. But I also will admit I let it happen every time. I don't know there's one time that I can honestly say that I could not have prevented it had I really wanted to. Every time I could have prevented it. Every time I could have turned the tables. And I want to tell you it's a dangerous thing when the people begin to find that out. Because you will begin to live in obedience. And when you begin to live in obedience, watch out. Things are going to happen. Now, it may not be according to certain things. I mean, this one may not get boom, 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 boom. And things may not begin to fill up and things may not go on. It may not happen like that. But I told the young people at camp, Brother Helm's life really did not begin to produce fruit. I'm sorry if that name offends you, but you're here because of that name. We're trying to cut off our heritage. Brother, I won't have it. Not when I'm alive. 
That's a spirit of darkness. Don't ever, don't ever let. Don't, if the devil steers your heritage, he'll get your future. Because if you give him one thing, you'll give him everything. I told the young people that they can defeat the powers of hell. I told them they're not subservient to them. And I told them that we were there because somebody obeyed God and Reverend Helms' ministry did not begin to produce fruit until he was in his 50s. I mean really produce that we could see. That we could see. 50s. Now I said, just think about it. If you all will not just be hit, miss, bang, bing, bong, that, if you'll just walk a straight line with God, your life is going to produce thousands we're not talking about hundreds. We're not talking about 50. We're not talking about a bunch of little churches spread all over the country. We're talking a produce, a harvest of multiplied thousands. And it's not this. Yeah, if each one wins one, you win one, and then two wins four, and four wins eight, and eight wins 16, 16 wins 32, and 32 wins 64, and 64 wins 128. It's not like that. Bro, that's just multiplication tricks. But you may win one. And one may win a country. But I want to tell you, if we will just walk with God, there will be no problem with the earth being taken. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 2. God wants us to be, to be informed about warnings. You're given the word to be warned. Many times you're warned. Many times things like cars and houses and material things rob people from the kingdom of God. Amen. People get disgruntled with the church. And so they decide they're going to do something that's conveniently going to keep them out of church. And then about halfway in the middle of the thing they get victory and they think, I'm in a hard place. Yes, you are. You want cars and houses and all different kinds of things. And I want to tell you, just want God's will and He will give you the best. Now that's what we really have got to see here. People beginning to really experience that. Not just talk about it. Oh, don't you dare say, I'm a Christian, I'm a great Christian, I go to church three times, you know, I do this thing. And not walk with God, don't you do it! Because you're deceived by one of the great deceptions in this world today. He said, I just want to be one of those type of Christians. You know, the kind out there and all around us. I want to be one of those kind. God didn't call you to be one of those kind. If He's got you here, He wants you to be one of these kind. He wants you to be like you're like. Pastor Ryan ought to be producing himself and you all over the place. You're warned that you just can't do what you want to do. You can't. You're not your own. You've been bought with a price. And that price is the precious blood of the Lamb. You're not saved by the blood. You're bought by the blood. And it's being in the arms of the possessor that makes you saved. We think salvation is a certificate God gives us and we hang on our wall. Yeah, I passed the Jesus Christ School of Salvation. There's my diploma. That's not salvation. Not in the full sense. Many people want a blood washing, but they don't want a blood cleansing. Let me tell you, it's not a dichotomy. It's not them and us. It's of all of us together. You're not, listen... You may be sitting here tonight thinking, I'm not one of the spiritual ones. You are wrong. If you are saved of God, you are one of the spiritual ones. We don't have super spiritual people and pastors. And then lady, all of you are called to be the same. You're all called to be kings and priests in the kingdom of our God. Doesn't matter what row you sit on. Doesn't matter what time you come to church. You are just as cold as the next person. 
There's not more called than others. That's the self in us. And last, God wants to make us an He wants us to make an informed choice about overcoming. Because you know, there's something I've got to fight in my life, and I'm sure if I do, you've got to. You wake up in the morning and go, Oh, I wonder if we'll go walk with God today or not. Oh. You do it. I watch your lives and I can tell you do it. Because sometimes I see you you're one way and sometimes I see you you're another way. Let's get honest. Let's live down where we walk. And quit jumping and skipping and throwing hankies and all that kind of stuff and acting like, you know, it's just all great in here. The test is outside these walls. Well, we're going, oh, I don't want to do God's will or not today. I believe, I believe that that choice is in all of our hearts every morning. You can live as much in the Spirit that day as you choose to live. And that does something to me. That encourages me because I know that every day I make the choice. And I don't have to pray like this. Oh, God, Lord, Lord, do something. Lord, help me. Lord, do. Lord, I'm just getting, well, to get whipped and strangled. Oh, God, help me. I've just been hung here. Changes my prayer life. It's like, God... I can do this thing if I allow you to have your way. Now, God, help me not to be an idiot and think I can do it on my own. And help me not to choose something else over you because that's what I do. It's a choice. I choose something over His will. God wants me to pray in the car and I choose to listen to the radio. I've made that choice. So, Brother Joe, I can't discern my right hand from my left hand. No, don't tell you can discern more than you think you can. God wants us to make an informed choice about overcoming. Jesus calls you and I to a life of perfection. And I found just today the best, the best definition of that in the whole world. It's from John Wesley. And after all I've read of him, I never found it. Perfection is constant obedience. And we know it's possible because we've seen it live before us. It's possible. Matter of fact, it's even probable. And it's not only possible and probable, it's planned for you and I. It's planned for everybody. You and I have great things ahead of us. Amen. If we'll get to it. You say, why do you always put that little word if and then... Because it's always a toss-up. But I want to tell you, if you'll just do your four essentials, you're about 80% there. Yeah. Void in the negative is not enough. See, I, I want to get to the time where people are coming to the altar, not just because they have bad things in their life, but because they want good things in their life. I want the altar to be a place where people are coming saying, God, I want this person to be saved. Or God, I want this quality in my life. Not God, take this out. Let me take this out. You know what? If God takes everything out of us, what we're going to be? A void. We're going to be walking around like this. Zombies. God doesn't want spiritual zombies. He wants to not take things out of us so much as He wants to put His life in us. It's like this. You got this trash can. And it's filled with garbage in plastic bags. You open the lid on that thing and you look down in there and there's trash. Now at camp, these kids, they, they kind of like reproduced eating vomit. And that didn't sit well with me. Because that's not the kind of thing, and you know, I got a weak stomach and I don't like to see that thing. But it, they really didn't do it, but they just kind of acted like it. And you look down in that trash in that can. And if people tell you that's what that can's for pretty soon, all you're going to look to expect to open the lid is garbage. But I want to tell you, you could take the lid off that can and put a nice, clean plastic liner in there. And then you could begin to take 
You have your own staff of servants, of course. And they could come up and could begin to empty pints of your favorite ice cream, haagen of course, <laughs> into that thing. And you could make yourself the biggest Sunday you've ever seen and have a great time in it, invite all your friends and they can eat in that. You say, that's stupid. <laughs> well, let me tell you something. It's about the same type of thing in the lives we live. We go up and all we look, look for when we open our hearts is garbage. Garbage, garbage, garbage. The garbage never gets taken out in our hearts, it seems like. But God wants to make an ice cream sundae in there. God wants good things for you. I'll say it again. He wants good things, great things, tremendous things for you. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait. Yes, for you. He wants it for you. Hey, you know what else? He wants it for you. And you. He wants it for all of us. You're not, you can't hide in here because God wants great things for you wherever you're at. Great things. Tremendous things. And I'm going to prove it to you. Chapter 2, verse 7. Get your finger ready. He that has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. To him that overcomes will I get to eat of the tree of life which in the midst of paradise of God. Go back to Genesis with me real quick. God took the tree of life out of there. He put it in the middle of paradise and He wants everyone here to eat of it. He wants us all to eat of it. That's what happens if we overcome. Let's go to the second church. 2.11 he that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. He that overcomes shall not be hurt of the second death. Overcomers. Look, that's what else we get. Man, this is like caramel and hot fudge. And now go up to verse 17. We're going to get some nice good nuts on there. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. And I didn't realize this until I just read it. To him that overcomes, I will give to eat of the hidden manna. That's your ice cream sundae. And I'll give him a white stone and the stone a new name written which no man knoweth save he that receiveth it. I know every one of us. I know we think, oh, I don't like who I am. I don't like what I look like. I, you know what? That's a great thing because you're going to be real pleased with your new self. And your new name and your new body and your new place of living, you're going to be real satisfied with that. Go down in verse 26. And he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron as the vessels of a potter. They shall be broken to shivers, even as I have received of my Father. 3 verse 5. He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. And we're going to be standing there and he's going to say, I want to tell you, and he's going to name the name and we're all just going to be sitting there and Jesus is going to say, hey, that's you. He said, that's not my name. He says, I know, but it's your new name. Here's a stone. Here's your new name. You know it now. And he's going to confess us, everyone, before the Father. And you get all excited if some preacher confesses you before a crowd. It's the truth. I know it. 3 verse 12. He that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God. He shall go, out, he shall go no more out. We don't have to say goodbye to God no more. Isn't that great? And I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is the new Jerusalem, which cometh down out of the heaven for my God. And I will write upon him my new name. Some of you have been wanting to go to Israel. You've never been able to get to Israel. Someday you're going to Jerusalem. Amen. We're all scheduled on that flight. Yes, sir. Don't give up your ticket for a piece of porridge. Right. You're going to the new Jerusalem. Every one of us will be there. Nobody will be left home on that trip. Isn't that great? Yes, sir. Verse 21. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me on my throne even as I have overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. He the half an ear. Let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. God wants us to make an informed choice about overcoming because look what's ours if we do. Yeah. 
I'll see you in Jerusalem.